the future of music in space. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. This week we're going to look at the future of music in space with Doug Halvering, host of the Daily Doug. Now, from the earliest rhythmic beats made by our distant human ancestors to independent musicians currently pushing the limits of music on YouTube channels, music has always evolved and changed with society. In turn, changes in music can bring about cathartic change within the human psyche. Today, we look at three of the major causes driving the evolution of musical expression and see how the human migration to space could affect the music of the future. Now, many of the great changes in music have come from the migrations of people and the collaborations they inspire. Changing economic and political conditions have also inspired musical change and the evolution of technology constantly defines the limits of what is possible. Music helps define who we are, both as a species and as local communities scattered around the globe. When local populations come into contact with one another, musicians are naturally drawn to explore and collaborate, much like scientists. The musical amalgams which form can give birth to new styles of music well removed from their original roots. During the 16th and 17th centuries, European travelers to the New World brought the folk music of Europe with them. Much of this remained preserved even as the same new songs were largely forgotten on the European continent. Over centuries of slave trade, Africans enriched American music with unique instruments and sounds, including gourd rattles, drums, and the African banjo. Call and response, one of the primary techniques in modern music had African roots. During the opening decades of the 20th century, the isolation of uh, groups of people in the Appalachian Mountains formed a unique folk scene musical style. As these populations began to migrate out to cities during the 1920s, these musicians began to play with gospel and blues musicians developing the foundations of country music and gracing the world forever with Dolly Parton. Musicians living aboard the space stations and habitations of the future will likewise face long periods of isolation punctuated by sudden changes to the people around them. And that is likely to feed music as it always has. Musicians from around the world will gather together in groups, creating music for the next stage of the human story. Musicians are likely to find new inspiration, sounds and instruments as people from all nations and walks of life lead out their lives together within space habitations of the future. 1975, as the Vietnam War was coming to an end, DJ Cole Herc set up a pair of turntables at a parties in the South Bronx and hip hop music was heard for the first time. This region was going through rough times, facing a series of fires and a crumbling infrastructure. Hip hop, based in part on the repetition of listeners' favorite parts of songs, offered hope and a temporary escape from the difficulties of life. Now space is hard and we're certain to face tragedies great and small as we head out into the cosmos. Lives of the first explorers would be difficult within small space stations and far-flung outposts. Births and deaths inevitable on the final frontier will provide inspiration for musical expression for years to come. The turmoil of the 1960s radically changed music over just a few years. Simple three-chord rock and roll grew into far more complex forms, during that second half of that decade, typically heard in songs of the Beatles and the psychedelic sounds of San Francisco. The California sound of the mid-1960s, initially epitomized by the Beach Boys, was fed by a migration of musicians to Los Angeles 
giving rise to Crosby, Stills and Nash, Joni Mitchell, the Mamas and the Papas, Carol King, and more. Acoustic music was suddenly in vogue, inspiring classic, largely acoustic albums from a wide range of musicians. Now, just as popular music turned simple and acoustic in the 1970s, technology came around to move fast and break things. Starting in 1969, Kraftwerk embraced the coming wave of computer technology and sounds. Soon after, private parties in New York and Philadelphia played rock music infused with a heavy four beats per measure, and disco was born. The inevitable backlash to disco, thank God, and stadium rock gave birth to punk rock. Now, before long, music from bands like Blondie and the Talking Heads, not quite punk bands, merged with technology once again. In 1980, the song Cars by Gary Newman hit the U.S. charts, and synthwave music filled the air. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. As we move into space, music's going to come with us and sounds, instruments, and styles with, will change with these explorers. We talk with Doug Halvorin, classical composer and host of The Daily Doug, about the future of music in space. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're going to look at the future of music in space with Doug Halvering. He is one of my favorite uh, show hosts. He is host of The Daily Doug. Welcome to the show, Doug. Hi. Welcome. Thanks. Yeah. Good to be here. Fabulous. Fabulous. So I think one of the one of the important things that music does for us is mm. that it provides us a, it provides composers and performers a chance to tell us something about themselves. Mm. So first of all, let's start off with where do you think we are today? What is, what is today's music telling us about ourselves? Oh, my goodness. Um <clears throat> you know, it's been interesting over the pandemic. Uh, I was um, eager to see what music would be, what new music would be coming out to try to make sense artistically of what's been going on in the world recently. And a lot of this music is just now starting to really come out uh, here in the early part of 2022. There's a lot of new albums by a myriad of different artists. And um, it's been interesting uh, to, uh, uh, to to look at it and to hear it. Um, the It seems as though people are um, reprioritizing and, mm -hmm. and kind of looking to the big questions during this time. And, and uh, that really, um, uh, gravitates with me. I, I love the, the larger questions uh, because they're a little intangible and hard to get at, but we've had time to ponder them. And musicians and artists have uh, had uh, this uh, kind of break in the, the frenetic pace right. of life and been able to kind of go, go back and, and look inward and, and really say some profound things. And I think that's that's where we're at. Uh, I think it's uh, the, the future of music is is bright, and there's um, just some wonderful sounds uh, being being made. Absolutely, and you know, one of the things when you're talking you're talking about that, I was thinking of uh, you know all the musicians, both professional and amateur, mm. who have you know done songs together. You know, um, you know, for instance, Imagine. Mm. You know, 
And so I think, yeah, so how do you see technology influencing the networking of musicians? I think it's democratizing things a bit. And, you know, especially with people like me who now have like mobile recording studios basically in our homes. The technology is allowing us to to connect with each other in ways that we would normally be able to connect. Uh, I was talking just last week with a musician named Arjen Lukasen, who uh, is a Dutch musician. And, and for his new album, he had folks that uh, were all around the world just putting their, their tracks in and sending to, you know, into, uh, you know, the, the mothership and and they put everything together so no longer do musicians have to even be in the same room or the same continent to put a, a record together uh, i also interviewed uh, neil morris who's a wonderful uh, mm. prog musician and he has a new side project with uh, ross jennings and with nick de virgilio uh some some friends of his and it's like a, a crosby stills nash record and to hear him say uh, it, we're singing in three-part harmony, and it sounds lovely, but we've n- never sung these songs live in the same room before. Right, right. It's right. amazing. Yeah. It's ap- the, the, the way that we're able to um, um, to put these piece, these puzzle pieces together using technology and make them sound, uh, you know, great is 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 a wonder to me. So I, I, there's no telling what, what uh, our artists are going to come up with. And, you know, that's interesting because now I wonder, you know, it seems like one of the great driving forces changing music over time has been migrations. Mm. You know, I'm thinking of the movement of people, musicians from the Mississippi Delta up to Chicago. Sure. You know, in the, you know, early 20th century um, movement of people, um, you know, to the suburbs changing music, um, you know, in the, both in the 20s and 70s. So how sure. does, how does, how does, um, how does, te- does technology and how, and the effects or mitigate the effects of migrations? Um, to music? I- I'm not sure. It's it's something that I think would be really advantageous to keep an eye on. You know, uh, w- before we had the um, the ability to record uh, sounds and play them back when we wanted, just just basic. You know, 70, 80 years ago, you know, if you wanted to hear something, you had to actually go to the concert hall and hear it. Or if you wanted to hear music in your house, you had to play it. And you know what you know. And as people move around, they'll take their their instruments with each other with themselves, and, and they'll they'll travel around. Like this is the type of music that I know. Oh, what are you playing? That's interesting. Mm-hmm. How is it different? And and you start getting cohesive sort of mixing of what used to be you know differing styles. And as we go on uh, from generation to gener- to generation, with the ability to record sounds now and now video and and access to broadband, I think it can have a mitigating effect, or it can uh, help uh, that that sort of cross pollination in a way that uh, it wasn't able to uh, previously. It's a sort of a democratizing mm-hmm. effect, I think, with the way that we interact with music from different parts of the world, different cultures, uh, to the ones that we uh, know best. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious what you think. Um, well, first of all, what what might before you know, what might remain? Is there mm-hmm. um, you know, to me it seems like, for instance, vocals, you know, allow people to tell a story. Okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, will are we likely to see vocals remain we're likely to see rhythm remain or could we even those most basic aspects of music be stripped away you know if i if we think back uh if we were asking this question 500 years ago hmm. um in the um in the 1500s or even like in the um in the early 1600s like the, the time that bach was alive uh you know in the, in the late 1600s um and we think about what's still true now 
that worked back then. And I think that um, we'll always have people gathering together in a room in a shared space and and making their sounds whether it be with their voice with their instruments and feeding off of each other that's always i think going to be a major part of it because music is how we uh is part of how we tell our stories you know and how we narrate the things that we have come to understand and the, the experiences that we've had it allows us um uh, organization of thought mm. and of sound and it um, you know you think about it anytime that we're telling a story in, in a movie now there's got to be a soundtrack if there's not it sounds like it's not fully there right. and uh, you know when when humans built kind of the most um, expensive way <laughs> to to share our stories uh, back in the day with opera you know, and now it's kind of, it's movies, but back in the day, it was uh, opera, was it? You had the stage, you had all the cast, you had all the musicians in the pit, you had the staging, and if it was there, if it was electric, you had lighting and all that sort of stuff. And it takes a massive amount of, of people power to make this, this thing that, that we now have, whether it's telling stories about, uh, Greek mythology, or, or the human condition and love. Uh, it's, it's a way for us to, to narrate our um, understanding of the world around us. And I think that's always going to uh, be a, a part of humans making music. We, we bring our voice or we bring some sort of instrument and we, we join together. It's, it's, um, it's a wonderful thing. When people are making music, we're typically... Uh, not fighting with each other, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's w w when music is being made among humans, especially among people from different parts of the world, magical things happen and barriers break down and um, your ability to uh, observe and interact with the broader uh, world is, is more easily, you know, attained and it's it's it, what it's what draws me to music every day really so fabulous and it seems like you know there have been a few times you know the music of course is a huge subject but i mean looking at you know 20th mm. century american music seems like you know there have been a few times you know in the early 20th century the 40s right around 1970 you know when music not only went through evolutionary changes, but went through revolutionary changes. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I think that was partly driven, you know, certainly in the early 20th century by the introduction of electrification. You know, the um, rise of, you know, larger bands and where, you know, probably the, uh, you know, Charlie Christian was happy that he had electrification to get over that huge orchestra. You heard of mm. that huge orchestra. And you've got a medium like radio to distribute it. Exactly. You know? Right. And, right. You know, Bing Crosby could not have had a career 30 year if he was 30 years older. Right. Because you, I mean, to have a crooner sit that close to a microphone and i'm just going to sing to y'all a little bit hey y'all it's christmas time you know <laughs> it, it, and it's it's like okay that's a new way to sing it's a new style that i don't have to as an operatically trained you know singer to project over an entire orchestra to 1500 to 2000 people in a big hall without any amplification right and so technology always is in lockstep with um, uh, new ways that we um, make our sounds and new techniques. Hmm. And of course, you know, and of course, that led into you know rock and roll in the early fifties, and then you know nineteen seventies we see. Uh, well, first I think what's interesting is there's sort of after the turmoil of the sixties, we had this drawing back to the simpler acoustic. Mm. You know, type thing where we had, you know, everybody making an acoustic album. But then that led in pretty quickly to disco, which was certainly <laughs> electronic, you know, four on the floor. Um, and, you know, the beginnings of hip hop, rap, 
Um, and you know, by 1980, you're seeing you're seeing new wave music, you know, coming out on the airwaves, which is entirely electronic. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, and of course, we also had craft work in there. So how sure. you know? So how, how do you see technology changing music as we expand out in this space? Um, I, it's hard to say because. Y- um <clears throat> the once we started with uh being able to record ourselves and then we were able to to uh to house it right and then and then you know the 60s um <clears throat> and the rise like after world war II of of uh music concrete as a, as a thing taking uh, not only am i just going to take a look at all the notes that are uh, written for me in the notation and recreate sound, I can actually record sound in the world and manipulate it and layer it and uh, and run it backwards if I want to see if Paul's still alive, you know, or, <laughs> uh, you know, or, uh, and, and, and on and on and on and on. And, uh, you know, even as I've been going back and looking at these uh, classic albums from the 70s, the albums are, you know, 40 to 44 minutes long. The reason, uh, that's how much right. music you could fit on an LP, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, you know, what is a radio friendly song is a, uh, based on how much space, uh, uh, you know, an album takes up on an, on a, on an LP, on a piece of vinyl, you know? So how the material world interacts with sound waves and, and the way humans create them has always been, right at the center of the creative process. As I was talking with Arian uh, Lucasen uh, a week or two ago, he's a tall person. He is six, uh, six foot seven. Uh, and, and I'm six four. And uh, I have observed over the years, especially concert organists that I've worked with, who have these fingers that are like, you know, longer than, <laughs> it's amazing the reach that they can get uh, a friend of mine that can easily reach an octave and a half and I can barely reach a ninth, you know? So you think about it, rock piano concertos would not be uh, what they are. If rock didn't have the physical ability to interact with the piano, the way that he did with hands that were that big. And, um, you know, some guitarists with very uh, long or big hands can reach fingerings and and um, elements of, of how to interact with the instrument in a way that some other people may not be able to. And that's what creates the sense. Like, how is that voicing working? You know, because we're used to just this is the this is the sound that we get, or this is how, you know this is the fingering for a C chord or a, or whatever. And and they're like, no, I can reach it this way. Uh, sounds even better. That you know, so it's. It's, um, you know, technology uh, goes with it, but it's, it's how we make use of it. And the artists that really think about, hey, if I did this this way, it's, you know, uh, it, uh, a, new, a whole new world. Um, barbershop, you hmm. know, four-part harmony. And I see these guys that are, like, recording themselves, and they put themselves in the screen. They, they multi-track it themselves. Who needs four people to do barbershop when, you're, uh, when, when you can do it yourself? <laughs> my little daily Doug intro is me singing all four parts. That's great. You know? uh, I don't have, you know, I, um, people um, respond to uh, my musical ear, my, my ear training that I've had, you know, over the years. Uh, that's, the, that took a lot of work. When right. I first started out, my ear wasn't attenuated. I don't have perfect pitch. And like, I remember being, you know, 10, 11 in my church, you know, youth choir and, and them going to my parents saying, can Doug sing a little softer? Uh, because he's not matching pitch. (laughs) And so it took me a long time to, as I got more into music and, and tried to, you know, figure out all the patterns and and what was going on there. Uh, the ear training was something that just kind of came along with it for me and the voice as well. I was a voice minor. Uh, in college, a composition major, voice minor, and um, getting into the mind, being able to write for the for the voice is almost like being a psychologist at times because we don't vocalists don't have a button they can push 
to help them get the right note out, you know, like, a, you know, like a fingering on a trumpet or, uh, you know, if, if, if your guitar is tuned right, if you put your hands in the right spot and you strum the, the notes, you'll get the right chord. But if you say, okay, singer, you were singing in this key. Now you've got to jump to this key. Uh, good luck. And may the force be with you. you know, and sometimes you have to lead them in the right way. Uh, otherwise, um, especially if you're wanting to have them learn the music very quickly, uh, it, it's it's there's a trick to it for sure of being able to think if I was singing, how would I connect what I was doing to what I am going to be doing, and how do I help them um, do it in a way that's the performance is. Um, is comes to the forefront instead of us trying to figure out if they can or cannot do what they're trying to do. You know, that's, that's my approach as a composer, at least when I put in my, uh, when I write all my stuff, I, I typically sing all the parts just say, can I, could I, could I get from that place to that place? And if I can, then surely most intermediate people, you know, that are, that are doing it can as well. That's fabulous. And finally, um, where do you see music heading next? You know, like what would happen on now? That's something that's tricky because um, our understanding of music, sound travels on air, right? Mm -hmm. the, if we're in microgravity, uh, like on the space station, you can still perform, you can still play instruments uh, because there's air inside. Um, even though there's not, like if you're if you're doing a um, um, and an instrument that requires breath, you know, right. like a clarinet or a flute, even though like if you're expelling air and a little bit's coming out the flute, if you're in microgravity, it's going to push you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. You no, know? oh, that's interesting. Uh, so, so you'd have to like anchor yourself. You know, there's also the bit of like, w would NASA let people take a cello up into, uh, which is flammable <laughs> into the space station because they tend not to like things that are flammable inside us in, in, you know, in that sort of environment, you know, you step outside into the vastness of space and um, sound waves, like there's nothing for, there's no air, there's no friction, there's nothing for the vibration to really vibrate so that we right. can hear it. So uh, as we, you know, colonize and go to Mars and all those sorts of things, uh, I'm sure we'll take our instruments with us and we'll take our, our recordings with us. It might end up, uh, the digital um, moving forward might be the easiest way to interact and keep connecting uh, yeah. in that way. Uh, but um, it, it's, it's just an interesting thing to think about, isn't it? I know that NASA has done some, um, some research on how uh, music playing and uh, it, you know, how, how it works in either like microgravity or with not a whole lot of, of um, air pressure. And there's, I think they're still working on it, but it, it's it's going to be interesting to see where it goes. As far as here, on, <clears throat> excuse me, here on the planet, I see a continuing, absolute like mixture cohesion. Uh, the uh, in another generation or two, um, quote unquote, uh, Far East music or Prague or. Um, Native American music or music from the African continent or Indian music, it's all going to start being intertwined. Right. I think. Yeah. Because people are going to say, I really like that sound, you know, and you'll end up with a didgeridoo in the middle of a pop tune or, um, you know, ragas and talas uh, from, from, from Indian music uh, ending up in Prague music. And I think it's just going to be a, a sharing of ideas and musical aesthetics. And I'm here for it. Be interesting to watch. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I saw a Mongolian band that does throat singing do a Metallica cover. Right, right, right. And it was good. Wow, it wow. was good. Wow, <laughs> what? I can't, I can't do it now. The throat singing, right. but the, it was wonderful, you know. And um, I, I've met you know, my channel, uh, the Daily Doug. I as a as a classically trained person i've been teaching and really uh go in the the classical vein of trying to keep up with all that re repertoire for the last 10 or 15 years and so over the the pandemic i i took that opportunity to um to start looking into all of this other music that i had neglected and um 
the great thing is there's always more music being made and there's always more music to to uh, to listen to and to hear every day it's i get to listen to a new piece and it's wonderful uh to uh, to have the time and um the ability to uh, to explore all of these different sounds and um just having the time of my life uh mm -hmm. doing it it's really fun rewarding Absolutely. And just want to, you know, I always think that as we go out into space, as you know, you, as you touched on, we're going to be living pretty much, we're going to be living in international communities. People living on the moon 40 years from now are going to be, you know, living in with, among people whose ancestors sure. came from all over the world. And there's also, it's called the overview effect. You know, if you've heard, but when people go into space and see the Earth as a fragile blue right. marble without national borders, you know, without right. the petty squabbles of your perception would change quite a bit, right? And I think that that's part of the radical nature that you were talking about as the seventies happened, because that was the first time that we had those pictures, and we're like, okay. You know, 68, 69, and we're like, there's people on the moon, and they're looking back, says, that's Earth. Behave, y'all. <laughs> that's, that's who we are, yeah. you know? David Bowie certainly got a couple of good albums out of that. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I'm doing some David uh, Bowie music tomorrow on the channel, actually. Fabulous. Fabulous. Yeah. I'm looking forward, to, looking forward to seeing it, as y'all should be out there. So, <laughs> so thanks a lot, Doug. It was fabulous talking with you. Wonderful. Thank you. It was good to be here. Yeah. And that was uh, Doug Halvering, host of The Daily Doug. Check him out on YouTube or use the little googly thing. You'll find him. It's true. Now, there's almost no telling what new musical technologies might be developed by musicians living in space. Certainly, computer tech will play a large role in music born in the final frontier. However, if history is any guide, we are likely to see periods of electronic music interspersed with occasional returns to roots. For the coming decades, if the human race does not wipe itself out, through short-sighted hubris, we will journey to other worlds. These musicians will undertake, the musicians undertake this journey will bring their music and instruments with them. Inside these colonies, new forms of music will be born and help shape the future of music in space. Join us next week for Black Holes Don't Suck as we welcome as astronomer Dr. Abigail Frost to the show. She recently found that the closest black hole to Earth isn't a black hole after all. Make sure to join us uh, starting on 29th of March. Please subscribe, share, and follow us anywhere and everywhere and never miss an episode. Clear skies.